Hey there guys, my name is Ben Ferriolo, as you probably already know, and I really want to bring something kind of disappointing to your attention real quick. First off, please check out my most recent video just before this one. It is the monthly volcano update covering activity for February 2019. Also, there has been some earthquakes going on lately. Some interesting ones popping off. Let's see, we had a 5.2 near the Rake James. I have no idea how to say that. Rake Johnny's, Rake James, <laughs> I don't know. That's near Iceland. I believe that's near Iceland because Iceland's right there. It's just to the southwest on that major fault line that runs through there. And then we had another 5.0 in Papua New Guinea. Their volcano is still erupting, I believe. Then we had a 6.1 in Papua New Guinea as well. Go over 5.0 in Indonesia, this and that, this and that. And then there was a 6.2 in Fiji. So we had two sixes in the past 24 hours. Uh, the 6.2 in Fiji was at 567.4 kilometers in depth in the same location as the extremely deep magnitude 8.2 earthquake that struck late last year in 2018. I believe that's when it happened. Um, it was very large. It was like over a magnitude 8.0 or is around 8.2 or something like that. And it occurred around 600 kilometers in depth right near this area. So this could be an aftershock from that. Possibly, because aftershocks from large earthquakes, especially deep, focus, very large earthquakes, can, you know, they can persist for months. They can persist for months and wax and wane. Then we have some more earthquakes up near Japan. It seems like the ring of fire is starting to heat up a little bit. Don't know where this is headed, because it was kind of quiet last night, and I woke up, and it, it definitely looks a lot more active. We had a 4.6 near Saudi Arabia, 5.4 near the Southwest Indian Ridge. Not too much else, but I wanted you to take a look at this. What? First off, oh, by the way, this is a 1.0 in Colorado. That's part of the aftershocks from the magnitude 4.5 they recently have near Dove Creek. And so this 4.3 in Rocky Mountain House, Canada. Okay, this is weird. Let's zoom in and look at the location. Of course, just like I said before, the Cascade Volcanoes are all going quiet except Lassen Peak. So I did see a sharp increase, and you can see all of this information in my recent volcano update. It's the video just before this one. And it's also interesting to note that USGS was saying the same exact thing that I was. Activity update for the Cascade Range volcanoes, all of them. All volcanoes in the Cascade Range of Oregon and Washington are at normal background levels of activity. These include Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams in Washington State, Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, Three Sisters, Newberry, and Crater Lake in Oregon. Those are just the majorly monitored ones, guys. They do. There are other volcanic areas in those states. Seismic activity was remarkably quiet this week, and not just this week, but past months as well. Each month, it keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower, and it's not just that. Yellowstone uplift and subsidence has both stopped. It seems like it has flatlined the past few months, and guess what? Long Valley Caldera has flatlined as well. To me... I don't like this eerie silence, guys. I do not like it. I do not like it. It's strange. We should be seeing a lot more activity than we are seeing at these volcanoes. Sorry, I'm getting off topic, but I just wanted to focus on this just super quick before I get to what I wanted to talk about. My goodness, it's taking a long time. Okay, so it happened. Let's see. There's Washington. There's Seattle. There's Vancouver, Kelowna. Calgary and Edmonton. It happened between Calgary and Edmonton, Edmonton excuse me, but to the west in a strange spot. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are uranium mines up here, right? Does anybody know who Uranium One is? If you know who Uranium One is, then they are up in this area somewhere. Canada does make our nukes for us. Magnitude 4.3. And if they say it's 10.0 kilometers in depth, do not know if that is true or not, because they also use 10 kilometers in depth exactly as a statement to say, hey, we don't know where the depth is, because sometimes that happens where they cannot constrain the depth. Seven people reported feeling this earthquake. Seven people, guys. Very interesting for a 4.3 in Canada. Very strange location. Very, very, very odd. Uh, let's go to phases real quick. Let's go down and see what the closest seismic station was to this event. Quick arrival time. RV Tonia. Hopefully that works. 
Here we are in the Seismic Program Swarm. I added the data stream from Tonia in the RV network, which according to USGS is the closest seismic station to this event. Notice we are in the Program Swarm. That means we can see the waveform seismogram plots, the spectra plots, or the spectrogram plots, which seismic spectrograms are almost always generated from seismic stations. You will know why I'm saying that in just a second. Let's turn precision rescale off, set overlap to 95 for the spectrogram. Maximum frequency is good. I'm not going to add a filter yet, but I might have to in just a bit. Let's just look at this completely unfiltered at first. That looks that looks like clear P and S wave arrivals. Upwards P wave, which I believe means this station, excuse me, detected compression. Um, and then the S waves, I believe those are the S waves right there. And then the surface waves right there. Very interesting earthquake. Kind of long and drawn out, a little bit longer than what I would expect, but again, it was a, reportedly a magnitude 4.3. Notice, even though this is the closest station, we still see some dominant lower frequencies. Let's turn all of these off. Yep, look, all of them are back here. Let's turn this back on, shall we? This spike here is most likely because of the micro -seisms in the background. The earthquake itself, this event itself, started, I'm going to say, maybe around 0.5. 6 hertz around 0 0.6 hertz went up peaked at about 1.8 to 1.9 hertz and then just slowly died down from there so that's very interesting canada central not exactly central canada but close to it guys very strange location for an earthquake i mean i we rarely see earthquakes occurring out here every once in a while i know i did a video not too long ago about an earthquake kind of up here in canada but they do not happen that often so how come all the Cascade Volcanoes and other volcanoes are going quiet while strange earthquakes are appearing in strange places? You let me know. You tell me what you think. So now I want to bring something disappointing to your attention real quick. Let's just go back to the old faithful webcam just while we talk. Oh, it looks like we got some furry visitors near Geyser Hill. I think they're, that is up on Geyser Hill, right? I think so. I don't know exactly where they are where they are zoomed in at, but we've got a bunch of bison rolling through. Okay, so I know a lot of you and some other people do not trust the USGS. And sometimes, you know, maybe even rightfully so. However, what about YouTubers? Should you automatically trust the other side 100%? Me? I'm on neither side. To me, USGS could be doing a much better job at showing people the data and teaching normal everyday people how easy it is to access and analyze this data and analyze it and interpret it on your own from the comfort of your own home. Hell, I made a website all about it and it didn't even take too long. But I must ask the question, should everything on YouTube be believed? What if there were people out there purposefully trying to hide something from you due to them wanting more views or money and donations? Well, remember how I said I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads? I try my best to hold myself to that standard, and the whole purpose of why I do what I do is to teach others the truth so they can stop watching my videos and analyze the data themselves and start doing the work that I do. In regards to volcano monitoring, understanding the causes of different types of earthquakes, tremor, or surface events, the magnitudes of such events, and more is somewhat hard, and I still have trouble deciphering many of the things I see. However, does that also mean understanding the charts and plots themselves is just as hard? No. If anyone ever, 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 ever tells you learning how to read webby quarters, seismograms, spectrograms, or spectra plots is not easy, then they are lying to your face. Uh-oh, hope these bison don't get too close to the geysers. It is a complete lie that understanding how to read the different charts and plots is difficult. Don't let anyone tell you that it is difficult, because it's not. The only thing you really need to do is read and understand the chart labels. After all, that is their purpose, for you to understand the data you are seeing. For example, I'm going to show an email in just a second. I got the permission from the sender of the email to me to show this on YouTube. This person sent an email to a YouTuber who has been covering Yellowstone for a long time. Now, I'm not going to mention her name because I mean no disrespect whatsoever in this video. But I believe most of you know who I'm going to be talking about. Now, I have been receiving an increasing amount of complaints via my email and comments on my YouTube videos about this YouTuber. Apparently, this YouTuber has been increasingly rude or agitated when asked even the most simple questions about volcano monitoring. I even tried to ask this YouTuber if they ever needed any help, and they would not have it, surprisingly. 
I mean, obviously, I still have a lot to learn, and I can be wrong a lot, just like any human being. But aren't two heads better than one? I really do not understand why this is happening when it is easy to understand how to read the many different plots and charts amateur and professional seismologists and geologists use to monitor volcanic hazard areas. Yes, again, it is easy, and anyone who tells you otherwise does not want you, the viewer, to know that this freedom exists, and it does. However, know that actually interpreting the events is much harder, but understanding the charts that's the easy part, guys. Also, do not forget to come to my page here. Go to my website. Go to the uh, How To drop-down menu and click Read Spectrogram, Seismic Plots, and more. It shows you how to read and understand web recorders, seismograms, spectrograms, and spectra plots. And some on this page will be mentioned in this video. Remember, though, please do not take my word for it. Unlike some people, I really want others to do this stuff for themselves. So, through their own personal experience and trial and error, they can confirm what I have to say is the truth instead of just blindly following general, very vague statements. So, check out this email real quick. So, this email was sent by my Lisa McKenzie Nowak. Please uh, let me know if I said your name wrong. I got permission from my Lisa McKenzie Nowak to post this on YouTube. She was not happy when she heard this. She was she only sent an email that said, I'm not certain how to get everything to pull up, such as the spectrograms, tilt meters, or any anything like that. But also, I had gotten this information today as I was looking at USBS. If you could please let me know how to view those items, I would greatly appreciate it. Sorry to keep you bothering to keep bothering you, excuse me. I'm just trying to do some research and read things too. Sometimes I like to look through the day. And she got a reply back from this YouTuber, and the reply said, Spectrograms are limited. They are data from deep wells. This information is not available from earthquake monitors. The spectrograms are specialized equipment. You need to learn what spectrograms are and how they work. This is not an easy subject to learn. What? What? Did the YouTuber even read this email? I mean, this person who sent the email to the YouTuber had a legitimate question an actual legitimate question that I would have been able to answer. This one person here, again, that emailed the YouTuber was asking a real and sincere question, which I, again, would have been completely open to answering. However, it seems in the reply, it seemed a little agitated, didn't it? Check this out. Look at the first thing. Spectrograms are limited. They are data from deep wells. What does that even mean that spectrograms are limited? In what way and how? See, these statements you see from time to time from this person are very general and never have any real explanation to back it up. Still, I am confused as to the reason behind anyone saying these things. What is the motive? This information is not available from earthquake monitors. Okay, that was a little bit random. Earthquake monitors? I assume they are mentioning seismometers, also called seismographs. If so, then this statement right here is a blatant lie to this sender. And it is very easy to disprove too. So seismographs cannot generate seismic spectrograms? Then how come I can generate spectrograms in the seismic program swarm like this? Look, frequency label on the left, time period at the bottom, records power, and frequency, and time period. Notice I have a spectrogram up. I can go from waveforms to spectra to spectrogram. Particle plot usually does not work. I don't know why, but we have the three analysis options on here. What? So I can generate spectrograms with the program swarm from seismic data obtained directly from the seismic stations themselves. I can even generate seismograms and spectra plots too. Wait a second, could these be a completely different type of spectrogram? Let's see. It says frequency hertz on the left, right? That is a frequency label in hertz, H-Z, frequency. And time period is obviously labeled at the bottom. Oh, wait a second. Doesn't that then mean that the UNAVCO spectrograms are still seismic spectrograms? I mean, come on, guys. It says frequency, MHZ, millihertz, on the left, which means it's a frequency label. I don't really understand how anybody could miss this label on the left, which is actually never mentioned by that YouTuber who uses these spectrograms. Again, MHZ, and notice 500 to 0, 500, 0. 
0 to 500. That means this entire spectrogram plot, each one, records frequency, time period, and power from 0 millihertz to 500 millihertz. 500 millihertz would be 0 0.5 hertz. Still far too low to show most seismic activity, except regional earthquakes, teleseisms, microseisms, and ultra-low frequency events like the Mayotte event. All of what I'm saying here can be proven very easily with a simple Google search or two, and half of what I'm saying can be easily proven by only, only by looking at the chart labels, which apparently a lot of people do not do nowadays, sadly. I don't know why. So where are these people getting these ideas that these are not seismic spectrograms? Even other seismologists around the world use seismic spectrograms which are generated from normal seismic stations. Notice frequency hertz on the left, which is, this is a very high frequency range, 250 is very high. And then amplitude dB, the strength, power, remember the color range is power and it records time. So again, this is another type of spectrogram. People in seismology use spectrograms all the time to monitor the frequency and the spectral content of earthquakes and tremor events. Again, if you ever have a problem understanding what a spectrogram is and people are purposely trying to deceive you and lie to you to your face, all you have to do is either look at the explanation on my website of what a spectrogram is and how to read it, or go to the Pacific Northwest how, what is a spectrogram link, which I will leave a link to that in the description box below. Or you can just do spectrograms yourself, read the chart labels, and understand how they work. Do not let anyone ever, 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 again, ever tell you that this is not easy. Reading chart labels and understanding how to read spectrogram plots among the many other plots is very easy. Now, interpreting the data, that's different. But understanding the charts, again, guys, is very easy. Do not let anyone tell you it isn't because they are trying to keep this freedom from you. And I want all of you guys to be able to have this possibility and have these freedoms. That is why I have a long list of links in every single one of my videos in the description box. That is why I have a whole website dedicated. That's why I have hundreds upon hundreds and upon hundreds upon hundreds of seismic plots and images on my websites, which include spectrograms as well for many different events. You know, because I want you guys to be able to do this as well and not to take my word for it 100%. Because people are blindly following the professionals or blindly following the YouTubers. There should be neither. You should never blindly follow anybody. If something sounds a little off to you and someone is saying a very general or vague statement without any facts to back it up, you really need to test it yourself. Otherwise, you could get very deceived. Again, we see a seismogram and spectrogram plot for two different events. Notice frequency hertz records power notice that there's this power scale right there and records time period as well again we see another type of strange looking spectrogram that records frequency on the left time period horizontally and the color range is obviously power with the seismogram plots at the bottom of each event and here's another very strange type of spectrogram that i am not used to but still look at the chart labels chart labels are there are there to help you understand things frequency hertz Time period, color range is spectral density, which is still power. Okay, so we just blew that statement out of the water. Again, I'm so confused as to why this YouTuber is so insistent on the fact that they are right. Don't get me wrong, guys. I can be very wrong about things, too. For example, go look at my really old videos from around early 2018. I was wrong so often, and sometimes even made myself look like a fool. I am okay to admit that because I'm open to it. It's called being humble, and it is something I wish many more people in this world were capable of. But remember, you cannot be wrong if you have a mountain of evidence backing you up, guys. But remember, quality is better than quantity, and understanding to read chart labels is paramount. Why else did all of our teachers in school grill it into our heads to always read chart labels? Want to know why they grilled that into our heads? It was to avoid misconceptions like these when you were an adult. It was to avoid situations like these, guys. The chart labels are always there for a reason, for you would not know what you were looking at if you didn't have the chart labels. One thing that doesn't make me happy is when somebody hides the truth from you on purpose, even if the truth is easily discernible. You know, and this doesn't make me happy either, because I'm trying my best to show as many people as possible how to monitor these volcanic hazard areas as much as possible. Don't you think that we should have as many people as possible monitoring these areas? The more people monitoring it, the less chance we are going to miss something, right? So then why shouldn't we have as many people as possible monitoring these areas? 
I'll tell you why some people don't want that, because it will go against their views and money and donations. Okay, so next they say the spectrograms are specialized equipment. Do you see that? The spectrograms are specialized equipment. Um, wrong field of study. Although there are a few so-called seismic spectrometers, which specifically detect seismic frequencies, which obviously the UNAVCO spectrograms record, seeing they have a frequency label, as you will see in a second on the UNAVCO instrument page, UNAVCO does not host any such seismic spectrometers. So that is off the list, as you will see in a second. So what about mass spectrometers? You know, sometimes on those crime shows they say, oh, go go look it up in the mass spec. Those are mass spectrometers. The those don't go in the ground, guys. Those are, yeah, they don't go in the ground as permanent gas recording stations, and they're extremely expensive. And number two, even if they did, UNAVCO still does not host any gas recording instruments whatsoever. I have to say, though, I know that gas instruments do exist at Yellowstone. They have to. I mean, it's a super volcano. It's gassy, guys. They have to have some gas instruments, but I have yet to find them. If you know where to find them, please let me know. I'm still looking. It. They better have them, because I'm starting to get a little frustrated that I cannot find any gas recordings or readings whatsoever for Yellowstone. Now again, special equipment is not necessary to create the traditional seismic spectrogram, which records frequency vertically, time period horizontally, and power. However, the seismic spectrometers sound very interesting. Note how you could tell a lot about the knowledge someone has about a subject if their terminology is off. Of course, it can vary, and some people use different terminology even if they know what it is, but it is good to stick with the correct terminology, guys. So again, the spectrograms are specialized equipment. Okay, so which equipment is it from? This YouTuber would probably say from spectrometers, right? Well, we just saw it's not a seismic spectrometer or a gas spectrometer or a mass spectrometer, so they have to be being generated from these seismic stations themselves. The seismic stations are almost always co-located with the strain meters in the borehole, and so let's go look at that right now. You know, I'm sorry if I seem like I'm getting a little frustrated, guys, because I, I'm really, it really disappoints me when people say they are dedicated to volcano monitoring or monitoring Yellowstone for any potential eruption in the future. And then they do things like this and try to keep the data and the truth and hide things from people when they blame USGS of doing the same thing that they're doing. Now let's go to instrumentation, go to geophysical instruments. This will show all of the instruments that they use. Just look at instrumentation. You can go on these other pages if you want. But this will show you all of the instruments that they have, that they use. Number one, GNSS GPS receivers. Collect GNSS data, which after processing is used to measure millimeter level surface motion measurements at specific points over a period of time. This is GPS stations, guys. You know what GPS deformation stations are, so we don't have to really get into that. Geodetic imaging uses data from radar or optical lasers. Okay, so that's off the list. I'm not seeing any spectrometers or gas spectrometers, guys. SAR satellites, a synthetic aperture radar. No. Terrestrial laser scanning. Definitely doesn't sound like a spectrometer. Land-based LIDAR, which is another type of radar. Laser strain meters. Ooh. Our long baseline on the order of 0.5 kilometers. Measurements of deformation 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 on the earth's surface now their borehole instrumentation their boreholes the deep wells that the youtuber mentioned is grouted in place 100 to 200 meters below the surface which i believe is around 356 feet to 658 feet i believe that's the number uh, so to operate at the low noise levels required to capture small short-term transients. The instrumentation in this borehole casing can include borehole strain meters to measure after processing crustal deformation. Does not record gas. Does not record melt depth. Deformation on a time scale of less than a second to weeks or months. Borehole seismometers detect seismic waves at periods of several minutes or less, obviously. Designed to measure fluctuate pressure, pore pressure sensors. Designed to measure fluctuations in groundwater pressure to help characterize the hydrological responses of sites, blah, blah, blah. Okay, still not seeing spectrometers. Still not seeing their specialized equipment. Where is it? I'm scratching my head. I'm confused. Where's their instrumentation? Why would they lie about it? If they were going to lie about it and not show their spectrometers, which I don't know why they would lie about that. If they were to lie about that, then why would they show any data, period? 
So next we have borehole tilt meters to measure tilt from crustal deformation due to deep earth processes such as volcanism and water table recharge discharge over periods of seconds to weeks. Meteorological systems can be co-located with other geodetic instruments to provide near surface atmospheric measurements. Tide gauge systems can be co-located with other geodetic instruments to provide sea level measurements. I'm not seeing any other instruments. I'm not seeing any other instruments. Let's go up. Let's go down. Not seeing anything. Let's go back up. Not seeing anything. Okay, so they do not have any spectrometers. They do not have any specific spectrometers, which is the specialized equipment that person in that email mentioned. Now, I don't understand why anyone would purposely lie about this. Maybe they're mistaken, but then again, if they're mistaken and have been told this fact over and over and over and been told this repeatedly and still spouting the same information, why would they continue to lie? To me, that doesn't really make much sense at all. Guys, and let's go to borehole strain meters. Remember, strain meters measure crustal deformation. I really want people to understand some of this stuff so people can stop getting deceived. Because I don't like people getting deceived by both sides. And yes, both sides are guilty of trying to deceive people, at least to some degree. Again, strain meters are at borehole depths between 100 meters to 250 meters. Again, they measure crustal deformation. Strain meters can ch detect changes in the diameter of the borehole in the order of four picometers, about one ten millionth of the width of a human hair. Yes, it can detect something that small. One ten millionth of the width of a human hair and smaller than the width of a hydrogen atom. What? Wow, okay, so does not look like it measures gas, does it? Nope. Okay, let's go back. Let's go to borehole seismometers and see what these are. These are normal run-of-the-mill seismometers that detect seismic waves. And that's where it goes in. Most of them are co-located with seismic, uh, the uh, borehole strain meters, excuse me. 70 borehole seismometers, blah, 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 in Yellowstone, Southern California. Sensors are Sonde 2 seismometers, which they use three 2 hertz geophones in a triaxial configuration. Eight sites in Anza, California region, also utilize a type of micro which are mechanical system, MEMS, accelerometer, again, blah, 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 blah. You can come here and read this if you want. A link will be in the description box below to all of their instrumentation so you yourself cannot get deceived. Again, a lot of what I'm saying in this video can be easily proven by some Google searches or everyday experience in creating these plots and looking at the seismic data, guys. Because I do this stuff for hours and hours upon hours each day, and it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. Once you understand it, you understand it, right? And understanding chart labels and understanding how to read the many charts and plots that amateur and professional seismologists use is very easy. Interpreting the events is not as easy, but again, reading the charts is very simple. Do not let anyone tell you it isn't, because I do not want people to deceive you. I'm sick and tired of it. I really am getting sick of it. One of my pet peeves, what really grinds my gears, are people who purposefully deceive other people to gain money, views, ownership, acceptance, or acknowledgement. You know what I mean? I just, I cannot stand people who purposely deceive people over big things, too. So, at last they said, look right here. Look right here. Like, really so rude. At least to me, it seems a little rude. And the person who got received this reply thinks that it was kind of rude too. They said, you need to learn what spectrograms are and how they work. This is not an easy subject to learn. Okay, that's what got me going a little bit. So this person emails this YouTuber with a legitimate question and doesn't even help in answers only with a general statement? Well, guess what? You can learn what seismic spectrogram plots are and how they work. It is called my website. <laughs> Then again, they say it is not an easy subject to learn. Want to know what is going on here? They said it is not easy to eradicate your hope of analyzing this stuff yourself so you could rely on them only. Well, guess what? Understanding how to read the plots is very easy, and my website teaches you how to do that. But again, do not take my word for it, do not take this YouTuber's word for it, and do not take the professional's word for it. You can easily teach yourself by everyday experience, paying attention to chart labels, and being open to being wrong. Because in order to learn, you must be wrong sometimes, guys. 
So again, it really is saddening me to hear that more and more people are getting agitated or rude replies from this YouTuber when asking the simplest questions of how to monitor these areas yourself. Doesn't this send a bad message? Doesn't this make amateur monitoring of volcanic areas look bad? That is what grinds my gears. Yes, Family Guy reference. <laughs> so what do you think? Please let me know in the comments section below. I really am hoping this YouTuber decides to change and be open to the possibility of being wrong. Being wrong is how we learn. But if this person is more concerned about views, money, and donations, then we are never going to see a change and this is going to continue into the foreseeable future. Again, if you ever want to learn how to read the different seismic charts and plots that people use, then please go to my website. A link is provided below. Also, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network gives a wonderful explanation on how to understand spectrogram plots and how they work. It's actually pretty easy because there's only three components. Frequency vertically, time period horizontally, and the color range you see is power. Again, on my website, go to the how-to drop-down menu and click read spectrograms, seismic plots, and more. Again, do not take my word for it. Do not take this Uber, YouTuber's word for it, excuse me, and do not take the professional's word for it. Simply try this stuff out for yourself and you will find the truth if you are open to it. I hope you all had a great day. God bless. And remember, I promised I will always stand for the truth no matter where it leads and no matter who gets mad at me. Be wary out there nowadays, guys. Despite what you think, it's not just the professionals doing things. We got some bad people on the other side. And I'm not saying these people are bad. They might be just extremely deceived themselves. But when they're told something over and over and over and over and over again, and it's a blatant truth, and you can easily prove it just by looking at the chart labels, but they continue to spout the same information that was just proven wrong, that makes someone scratch their head a little bit. And, you know, I just really, really, really am praying for her. I really, really am, because this makes us look bad. It really makes us look bad, because there's so many possibilities out there for volcano monitoring. So many possibilities, and I don't know why, what is the purpose of saying there isn't. I don't understand what's the purpose of it. I don't know. So I'm going to go continue to monitor these volcanoes the way I know best. And you guys have a wonderful day. God bless. See you later.